Hey, everyone. Hope you're all doing good and uh, staying safe. And uh, hopefully you're being able to uh, use this time of uh, terrifying isolation to uh, sort of take stock and maybe use this as a chance to sort of transform and better yourself in some way. I personally have been doing this by uh, going back to school. That's right, I have uh, enrolled in night classes at Prager University. Now when I say that, some of you may be thinking, Mr. Goat666, Black. Prager University isn't a real university, it's just a right-wing propaganda outlet on YouTube.com that's run by oil tycoons. And if you keep saying that it's a university, I swear to God, you better go jump in a lake and start splashing around because you're being a silly goose. <laughs> To which I would say, shut up, hippie, before I waterboard you with an American flag and a bottle of Texas tea. Prager University isn't run by oil tycoons. It's just funded by them. It's run by Dennis Prager, a man responsible for such sublime pieces of internet outlet as When a Woman Isn't in the Mood, Part 1, the first in a series of essays where Dennis Prager argues that his wife not wanting to have sex with him basically amounts to domestic violence. Now, I want to make it very clear that this channel has never been and will never be about encouraging violence in any form against any of the people who I make fun of on this channel, regardless of how repugnant their views may be. That said, in this context, I feel like most of us can get behind abusing Dennis Prager. Prager University has a well-documented history of putting out just astonishingly bad takes, ranging from saying that it's impossible for atheists to be moral, to calling for the abolition of basically all workplace safety regulations, to trying to disprove the gender pay gap. Now, the reason I'm talking about them today, though, is because... An I may be a little bit late to this party, but I just found out that they've had a rather surprising addition to their faculty in the form of former Prime Minister of Canada, Stephen Harper. Now, the majority of my audience is American, so I'm going to sort of go through a basic history of who Stephen Harper is and what he's done, and to any Canadians watching this who might find themselves bored, sorry. <laughs> Stephen Harper is a gigantic ventriloquist dummy who was brought to life by a vengeful ghost and served as Prime Minister of Canada from 2006 to 2015 when he was defeated by the liberal Justin Trudeau. Harper was more or less what you might imagine as a fairly boilerplate conservative. He was uh, pro-family values, very anti-drug. Pro fiscal responsibility and austerity, and really, really hates Muslims. Hey, I forgot to put this in the initial script, but Harper was also horrible on environmental issues. He deregulated the oil industry, downplayed the importance of climate change, silenced government scientists, and passed a law which allows environmental activists to engage in civil disobedience to be tried as terrorists. He also does not give a fuck about First Nations people, but that is in no way unique to Stephen Harper or even just the Conservative Party of Canada. Despite an extremely heavy focus on the economy, upon leaving office in 2015, Harper left behind the worst economic record in post-war Canadian history. Now, this was due in part to the recession, but also due to Harper's obsession with balancing the budget through austerity measures, which came at the expense of any government spending outside of corporate tax cuts, which would have certainly helped to stimulate the economy. Now, most Canadians I've asked to guess what Stephen Harper is up to after having left office, they usually go to just relaxing and playing music with his band, The Van Cats. which is a pun on the French number Van Capla, which is 24, a reference to 24 Sussex Avenue, the residence of the Prime Minister of Canada. And if that doesn't prove that conservatism is the new punk rock, I don't know what does. 
Fun fact, since leaving 24 Sussex, the band actually had to change their name since Harper does not even actually have a home anymore. Instead, he prefers a dank cave that he returns to each night when he turns back into snakes. Anyway, instead of just settling down and rocking out, Stephen Harper has been busy touring the American intellectual dark web, which is absolutely amazing, especially because people like PragerU do not seem to give a f who he is. In his bio on PragerU's website, they don't even mention that he was Prime Minister of Canada for almost a decade until well into the second line. Instead, they introduce him as an author and businessman. Like, this feels like, like imagine if George W. Bush went on Rebel Media and they introduced him as a painter. Anyways, on their YouTube channel, PragerU released a video featuring Stephen Harper titled Why Trump Won. So let's take a look at that. I was elected to the Parliament of Canada seven times, three times as Prime Minister. I did not expect Donald Trump to be elected President of the United States. But unlike most observers, I did think it was at least possible. Why? Because I sensed, as Mr. Trump surely did, that the political landscape had shifted. The video is pretty weird. Harper's monologue in it is taken almost verbatim from one of the chapters in his book, Right Here, Right Now, which uh, I suppose a more generic title for a book is physically possible. In the video, Harper makes a case for populist conservatism, which it should be noted has never actually been implemented. None of these tries were true populist conservatism. If it was ever implemented, it certainly would not involve genocide. So I guess firstly, what exactly is populism? It can probably best be understood as a style of politics, more an aesthetic or rhetorical tool than a specific policy or set of beliefs. Populists generally paint a picture of the world where we, the downtrodden, unheard majority, are being manipulated, repressed, or neglected by them, the out-of-touch elite few. There's left-wing populism, such as the Occupy or environmental movements that try to represent the 99% of people for whom the economy is not set up to benefit and who will be the most affected by the coming real-world adaptation of Mad Max. There's also right-wing populism, which generally tries to pit the rural, hard-working, traditionally valued patriots against the post-structuralist philosophers and lying, mainstream, fake Jews, I mean news, who control the media. <sighs> Killing it. This dichotomy is certainly there in Harper's video, but it's a bit weird how he does it. In our contemporary world, there are, as British journalist David Goodhart describes it, those who can live anywhere and those who live somewhere. Imagine you work for an international bank, computer company, or consulting firm. You can wake up in New York, London, or Singapore and feel at home. Your work is not threatened by import competition or technological dislocation. You vocally support all international trade agreements and high levels of immigration. You're one of those who can live anywhere. There are a lot of those people, but there are a lot more completely unlike them. Let's say you're a factory worker, small business person, or in retail sales. Your work has been disrupted by outsourcing, cheap imports, and technological change. Your children attend the local schools and your aging parents live nearby. Your social life is connected to a local church, sports team, or community group. So in Harper's framework here, the left-wing globalist cabal is made up of people who love immigration and free trade agreements so that they can work remotely from whichever city they like, which, um, you know, I don't want to be like too rude to my former prime minister here, um, you know, so I'm not going to say things like Stephen Harper looks like what would happen if a funeral director f***ed a Lego man. I'm not saying that. But, I mean, I know a lot of people on the left and none of them are that into free trade agreements. Although Harper would certainly know since during his nine years as Prime Minister of Canada, he did push for probably the most free trade agreements of any Prime Minister ever. And I mean, I, yeah, I don't want to say too much here, but the dude does work from home. 
But credit where credit is due here, globalization and the free flow of capital brought about by neoliberalism has allowed companies to move production to countries with less regulation. Meanwhile, costs are cut domestically through the exploitation of cheap migrant labor. Harper's brand of populist conservatism blames the global south for benefiting too much from neoliberalism, which first of all is not true, and secondly would not be a problem if it was. His solution to this made-up problem is economic nationalism in the form of a Canada or America first approach to trade agreements. Now, I'm going to switch gears in a second, but before I do, I just want to point out a couple things that I thought were neat and interesting. Stephen Harper is no radical. He does believe in moderate liberal compromises in order to keep the wheels spinning. But being pro-market does not mean that all regulations should be dismantled or that governments should never intervene to protect workers. Harper is in fact so pro-government regulation that he passed Bill C-51, which allows the Canadian government unprecedented powers to monitor its people. Being pro-immigration should never mean sanctioning illegal immigration, erasing our borders, or ignoring the interests of our citizens. Okay, so I don't have time to go that deep on this one, but the Canadian immigration process is fucked. It's based on a point system, which is heavily biased in favor of rich people. Also, fun fact, if you're disabled, it's just straight up impossible for you to immigrate to Canada. So, sorry. Being pro-globalization should not entail abdicating loyalty or responsibility to our country and our local communities. Unless those communities happen to be First Nations and, I don't know, don't want their land stolen so that you can build a pipeline through it. Being pro-trade does not imply that every trade agreement is a good one. So as I alluded to earlier, Harper was incredibly focused on trade. And I was planning to just bring that up here and call him a hypocrite, consider him owned, and move on with my life. but. I don't think that that's actually fair. I've been jumping around and avoiding playing too many clips from this video because while they are pretty funny, at least to me, they make Harper seem inconsistent and hypocritical, which at least in the case of his beliefs on trade, I don't think is true. I found a clip where Harper makes a more nuanced defense of his views on trade in an interview he did on, I'm so sorry for this, Ben Shapiro's podcast. There are two great things about Stephen Harper appearing on Ben Shapiro's podcast. I just felt my soul leave my body when I said that. The first, and this is in no way me defending Stephen Harper or like making an appeal to a bygone era of like conservative civility, but there are literally moments in this interview where Stephen Harper has to explain to Ben Shapiro why they shouldn't just get rid of the welfare system entirely. How many problems do you believe are brought about by individual decision making? So in a free country, it seems to me that, you know, for example, there's a Brookings Institute study. It basically says that if you do not want to be in permanent poverty in the United States, you need to do three things. You need to right. finish high school, you need to get married before you have babies, and you need to get a job, any job, anywhere basically and hold it down and you won't be in permanent poverty in the United States. And a lot of the folks who are having problems have made one of these three mistakes at the very least. Yeah. And we are now seeing folks who seem to be using the excuse, uh, you know, we shouldn't, uh, at the same time, when you're an elected person, you can't be little people. I mean, people have real challenges, real problems. Not everybody has the ability to make their own life from scratch. You know, we do depend on family and community and sometimes from government assistance. That's not all terrible or all something we should not expect to some degree. The second thing that's so good is that Ben Shapiro just regularly interrupts Stephen Harper so that he can plug the products. Well, in a second, I want to ask you about the trade policy that you would like yeah. to see pursued under sort of a populist conservative rubric. But first, let's talk about your investments. I want to talk about that and whether that is America specific or whether you think that that is breaking out in other places too. First, we have to talk about that face of yours. I mean, come on. New book out, we'll be talking all about that. But first, let's talk about your impending doom. Again, text that word CHIN to 77453. Well, back to a serious topic. So Understand here that by Harper's last re-election campaign in 2015, he had limited interaction with the press to the point where at each campaign stop, he would only answer five questions, all of which had to be from vetted news outlets, which all had to pay 
$1,000 for the privilege of touring with the prime minister in his press bus. Now, I feel like we can all probably agree that having to pay 78 k in order to ask the prime minister a question is ridiculous in a supposedly free democracy. However, that is actually a pretty good price for backstage access to the Van Cats. Anyway, here's Harper giving a bit more nuance to his views on trade. I, I probably have a record of signing more trade deals than just about any leader in the free world alive today. So I, I don't have much trouble saying that I'm pro-trade. But look, President Trump came along. I remember when we had this debate in the election, he came along and he started talking about good deals and bad deals. And people went, oh, you know, some, some quote economists started saying, oh, wow, he's a protectionist, bad deals. Um, he could be a protectionist. But can you have a bad trade deal? Absolutely, you can have a bad trade deal. And this cuts to the core of Harper's populism. After Obama vetoed the Keystone XL pipeline in 2012, Harper began looking to diversify Canada's trade portfolio, putting profit before any ethical concerns on some Canada first art of the deal type While the Conservatives were still happy to go on preaching about values, especially when it gave them a chance to justify austerity or shit on Muslims, they were now willing to do business with countries who they'd previously condemned, like China, Cuba, and Saudi Arabia. Oh, they did still make a point of going after Russia and Iran, and definitely for ethical reasons, and not because those two countries are Canada's main competition in the global energy sector. It's funny to think about how immediately after taking office, Trump approved the Keystone Pipeline. And just imagine if Harper beat Trudeau and conservatives on both sides of the border just shipped him and Trump the way that Libs did with Trudeau and Obama. This economic nationalism also extended into foreign aid, which under the Harper government became tied to trade. What this looks like, and this is honestly f***ed, is that Canada sends aid to a poor country in the form of a bilateral trade agreement where a Canadian, usually mining company, goes to that country and gets to extract their natural resources with absolutely no accountability or supervision. And if your response to aid in the form of private companies getting to do whatever they want is just what's the worst that could happen, well, first of all, hello, Mr. Harper. Thank you so much for watching my video. Is your band available for private functions? And secondly, in Guatemala, while evicting the residents of a small village whose land had been seized for Canadian aid, the employees of the Hud Bay Mining Company gang-raped a dozen women, dragged them into the streets, and set their houses on fire. Going back to Harper's depiction of live anywhere globalists, it seems kind of silly since Harper doesn't go after the actual neoliberal private interests that do support things like free trade and types of immigration because it allows them to make more money. These groups are off the table though because Harper doesn't fundamentally have a problem with any of these practices so long as they can be tweaked so that Canada benefits more than the global south. In classic populist language, Harper says that the nation is real and the global economy is just a concept. But the events I just described in Guatemala and countless similar ones which have occurred across the global south as a direct result of populist conservative policies are very real. And Harper is right that we need to be paying attention to the real economic problems that people face at home because of neoliberal globalization. But this is a problem that conservative populism can't deal with, since their only solution is to export these problems to the global south. I don't know, I don't want to end this video on some lame rallying cry of how they are trying to divide us by skin color so we won't see the true enemy, even though that is true, but man, I haven't left my house in like a week. Um, I don't know, be good to each other, don't allow uh, populist conservatism to take root and flower, um, stay inside, socially distance. Whatever. Cheers. So, uh, that was a fun, nice, uh, positive video, eh? 
Um, thank you all so much for watching if you got to the end of this. Um, our friend Will Jarvis was not available to make the music for this video, but he is safe and sound, and actually just put out an EP on Bandcamp, which we are listening to right now. It's really good. Check it out. Link in the... If you like this video, please, you know, like, comment, subscribe, and all that stuff. And, of course, a big, big, big thank you to all of my patrons. I have been uh, laid off right now, so uh, the, the money definitely helps a lot. But um, I also, like, really don't want to be uh, pressuring anyone into, like, becoming a patron now of all times. And this goes for my current patrons as well. Please, like, do not feel guilty about jumping ship right now. Um, like, that is very, very fine. Uh, if that is, like, the situation for you and that, that would be, like, really difficult, but you would otherwise, like, like to do something, uh, please just consider uh, sharing this video in, like, a, you know, subreddit or Facebook group or something like a Discord server or something like that. Um, that honestly would really mean the world to me. And, uh, yeah, like, please stay safe out there. And, uh, yeah, big thank you to all the patrons I do still have, um, especially to uh, Beth Solman, Brett Long, Comrade Sai, Iso Kun, Jacqueline E. Gother, John Price, Mr. Awesome Be Cool, Odo, and Stacy Solano. Thank you all so much. Peace.